gospel lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Now immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he sent the crowds away. And after he'd sent the crowds away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray when it was evening. He was there alone, but the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And at the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to, to you in the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came forward towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and became, began to sink. And he cried, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him and said, You have a little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him and said, You are certainly God's son. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this word, for this day. We pray that you would open up our hearts to your will. For we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And for those following along, we do have those in worship today. We have a handout so that you may watch it. And for those at home, guess what? The handout is posted to the announcement for today's service. And you are encouraged to follow along if you would like to. Otherwise, don't bother. You're welcome to, to just listen. I want to take just a moment. I am actually by myself recording this today ahead of time for the service. So I'm kind of playing both the multimedia person and the pastor here. So give me a moment because I want to change the screen to get, set the mood for today's service, if I might. Setting, setting on the water here for today. A little bit about the context of this story. It follows last week's lesson of the feeding of the 5,000, at least in the narrative of Matthew. Remember how we said Matthew is a catechetical book and he puts a lot of these miracle stories, bam, all crammed up into one here. Jesus saw the crowds, if you remember in last week's lesson, the feeding of the 15 to 20,000. Uh, and he had compassion on them. They fed them. He fed them. Not just preached at them. He fed them. Because honestly, people, uh, people respond better when their bellies are full, don't they? But he didn't want to send away all these people who had been following him without first feeding them. Because he was concerned for them. He loved them. Now, the problem is, many of these followers, you know what? They were what we might call rice Christians. You know, there are people who uh, would follow somebody as long as they were giving them something for free, right? They were following Jesus for what they could get out of them. They were the, the epitome of people who would jump on the bandwagon as long as it was going in the direction they liked going in. But then once it was, you know, once it went a direction they didn't want to go in, hey, I'm out of here, right? The disciples were tired of dealing with this type of unruly crowd. But, but, Jesus decided he also needed to take care of his disciples. So he said, okay, let's dismiss the crowds and let's go to a quiet place. So he sent them ahead of him across the lake so that Jesus would meet up with them on the other side. But Jesus was going to go to the mountain and pray and then meet them there. Give the disciples a little bit of a break. So here's my question. What were, what were the disciples thinking at this point? They were leaving behind Jesus. How did they know they were going to find him and catch up with him? How did they, this is kind of crazy. But nevertheless, they were obedient. They went across. But in the midst of that lake, there was a great storm that threatened the boat. 
They were terrified. We are told that Jesus comes walking towards them, and the disciples have a discussion, very heated discussion. Is it a ghost or isn't a ghost? They, after a lengthy discussion, decided it wasn't a ghost, that it was actually Jesus. Couldn't figure it out, but here he was. And so Jesus, once they figured it out, was asked by Peter, hey, if it's okay with you, I'll come to meet you. If, you can do, if Jesus can walk on water, so can I. Why not, right? So with the command of Jesus, Peter got out of the boat. He was faithful. He started to walk, but he saw the storm around him. He became terrified and distracted by all the chaos that was around him. And he started to sink. He's a rock. What can you do? Did you get it? He's a rock. A little left. Peter, the rock. Okay. At any rate, Peter needed to look up again to Jesus in order to be saved. And what does Jesus do? He obliges him. He reaches out. Now here's the amazing thing about this lesson, and this is the most important thing that I want you to learn about this lesson for today. Jesus doesn't scold Peter. He doesn't look at him and say, oh, I can't believe you, you dummy. Jesus never, those words don't cross Jesus' mouth. He doesn't scold him. He doesn't tell him how stupid he is. He uses a common idiomatic Jewish phrase. In other words, an idiomatic phrase is a phrase that doesn't translate well into another language. He says, you of little faith. Well, now, that is the direct word-to-word -word translation. You of little faith. But it doesn't mean what we think it means. We read in English, and what do we hear? We hear an indictment. I can't believe you didn't believe in me, Peter. That's how many pastors preach this lesson. But it's an idiomatic phrase. There's not a direct word-to-word -word translation of this. It doesn't mean what it means in English. It's actually a term of affection. We do that in English. We have phrases that seem really kind, unkind or cruel or whatever. They become words of affection, don't they? And if somebody were listening in a different language and knows our language and the direct word and word translation say, you just called him or said to him, what? No, really, it's a word of affection, trust me. Jesus speaks this word, you have a little faith. So here's probably the best translation I can come that accurately captures what Jesus really said to him and how Peter would have heard it. It's like Peter, Jesus ruffling him on the head like he's a little boy because this is a phrase that parents would use for their kids. He's ruffling him on the head with a big smile on his face and saying, oh, you silly little goose. What does that mean, by the way? Try to translate that phrase into another language. You silly little goose. I don't think other people would get it. But you get it just naturally because we say it quite often. It's an idiomatic phrase for which there's no direct translation. It's meaningless in another language. So is this phrase, you little faith. The best we can do is, you silly little goose. You can believe me. You can trust me. It's all going to be okay. You don't have to get distracted. Just look to me. The perspective of the disciples continues to evolve. At the end of this lesson, they called it Jesus Lord, or they called Jesus uh, the, the Son of God. Pardon me. And so you can see the progression how the disciples are kind of working through their brains who this Jesus really is. And this is just one more plank uh, that Jesus lays to help them figure out who he is. So it's, it's like a journey. When I say plank, I mean that, think of that literalistically in your brain. Uh, if you have two boards that are uh, over top, that, with a gap between them that overlooks a very, very deep cavern, and you want to get across there, you have a plank. You put that plank down, you step on that next plank. Then you put another plank down, you step on the next plank. And then you put another plank down, and you step on the next plank. This is what Jesus is doing for them. They're not there yet, 
But Jesus, bit by bit, is dropping a plank in front of them so that they can figure out who Jesus is. They start with him as rabbi. Rabbi, teacher. He's a miracle worker. He's the son of God. What does that mean? Well, they're one step closer. He's the Messiah. You would think that that would be <laughs> all the way across. They still don't get it, even when they come to confession that he is the Messiah. It's only when they understand that he is their Lord and their God that they finally get it. They're not there yet. And I think that tells us something massive today about how we should treat and respond to one another. Because I am convinced that this is what this means for us. How we are meant to apply this. We, you and me, grow in our relationship with God and our understanding who He is. Bit by bit. God will put another plank. We take another step. God puts another plank. We take another step, right? And so, somebody else who's a step behind us and a plank behind us, how dare we be judgmental? I had to step on that plank back here too to get to here. But I'm not all the way there either. So there might be somebody another step in front of me who looks and says, I can't believe he doesn't get that. Come on, people. Jesus doesn't scold Peter for not fully comprehending who he is. You silly little goose. You'll get there. It's okay. It's a journey. Again, I mentioned earlier, some people are rice Christians. They just come because they want what they can get out of Jesus. They want to be fed physically or materialistically or whatever. It's okay. They're not there yet. God will nurture them. Put another plank in front of them when they are ready to take that next step. Some people, in fact, most people probably in this world, only see Jesus as a, a nice man who had a few wise words to say. Okay, that's a beginning, right? If they continue to hear about Jesus, another plank might be set up. Like, you know what? There's something really unique about this guy. Well, you know what? Maybe he was the Messiah. Well, you know what? Maybe he was the Son of God. We well, you know what? Maybe he is our Lord and God. It takes time to be on that journey. And so we should not be judgmental. Number two, Jesus, you see, never scolds those who are seeking. The only people that Jesus ever gets really upset with are people who think that they have all the answers. So I'm going to tell you this. Um, I, I, I haven't confirmed this. I just saw this on the Facebooks from a friend, so you know it's true, right? So, um, but I, I imagine it is actually, there's a, there's a truth to it. Um, one of my friends posted something and said, you know, Jesus only answers like five or six questions in the entirety of all of the Gospels together. That's it, he answers five or six questions. Yet, he answers about 200, he asks about 200 questions for which he never gives an answer. Think about that. I think the point that this person was trying to make is that maybe Jesus wants to live in the unknown and, and, and it's okay to ask questions and to know that we aren't going to have answers to everything. We're on a journey. It's okay. So the only people who, with whom Jesus gets upset are those who think they've got all the answers and want to get everybody st straight. We need to allow people room to grow and explore and experience God. And yes, there is only one way. I just want to be careful. Ultimately, there's only one way to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. So I'm not denying that. But everybody's journey through Jesus is going to be different. Okay? Different than your journey. They don't have to come to God on your terms. They come to God in the way that God guides them. They come on their own terms, their own way, their own journey. Might, might wind around a little bit, might make you a little bit uncomfortable. It's not your journey. Okay? So we shouldn't be judgmental people in the journey in which they are on. 
Here's the thing. When we run out of answers and the storms of life threaten us, be a Peter. Look up. Jesus might ruffle our hair. Say, you silly little goose. Just look up at me. And I got you. And that's the best news of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love and adore us, and you're just on this journey with us. We are so uncomfortable with that. We seem to expect that everybody should be where we're at. <laughs> it's not the way it works, and we've not always been where we're at today. If we are in the same place today that we were 20 years ago, maybe we haven't taken enough steps forward, or any steps forward. We just need to keep walking further and further ahead in our walk and our relationship with you and growing. And just look around us to be an encouragement to those who are on the journey too. They might be a few steps behind us. It's okay. Good for you. Keep traveling. Keep working through it. Keep grinding through it. God is going to lay another plank for you when you're ready to take that step. We just give you thanks for that patience that you have of us. And pray that you would also help us to be patient with one another. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who are at the service today, you are going to continue on with uh, some music and songs. And so may God's blessing be with you in your worship as you receive Holy Communion today. For those at home who are just watching the sermon today, God's blessing be with you. Go forth in peace. Amen.